spacious skies for amber waves of green for purple mountains majesties above thy fruited plain America America God shed much grace on thee so spread the love sent from above from sea to shining sea oh beautiful thy immigrants who hail from every land their hope and heart and diligence like gifts from God's own hand America America thy grace, thy grace. and pride so all nations are blessed yeah. America America alone, alone cannot abide no God give, God give thee pause to, to mend thy flaws with truth Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church Online. I'm Abhi Janamanchi. My pronouns are he, him, one of the ministers serving this religious community. If you're new with us this morning, please let us know in the live chat. And if you feel comfortable, please fill out the newcomer form that's included in the chat. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are joining us from, whatever your beliefs, gender identity and expression or immigration status, 
you are welcome here. Thank you for taking a chance and taking a spiritual risk to worship with us today. If you've been attending for a while and are interested in becoming a member of this religious community, please reach out to Nicole Kazi, our membership and communications coordinator. Our pastoral visitors are an extension of our ministry team. They are available in the chat today to support you. And now I have a few announcements. Please join us today at 1 p.m. for our annual Memory Wall Ceremony to remember and honor the names of beloved members who passed away this year. The dedication will be streamed live to YouTube. On Sunday, June 6th at 5 p.m., join us on YouTube for a special interfaith multicultural spirit experience, We Breathe Together, as we come together in solidarity with the beautiful and resilient people of India as they continue to battle the COVID-19 pandemic and to raise funds to support COVID-19 relief efforts for India's most marginalized communities. We will hear from a diverse group of progressive faith leaders and activists and will be joined by leading musicians and artists from India and the Indian diaspora. We will be raising funds during the service for NGOs doing amazing work on the ground in India, Disha, the Umid Project, and Kisle. We look forward to seeing you there. On Wednesday, June 9th from 6 to 7 p.m., please join us on campus outside in the courtyard for our annual flower communion ceremony. The Flower Communion Ceremony was created by Dr. Norbert Chopek, who founded the Czech Unitarian Church in Prague. The ceremony is usually held in early June and involves members and friends bringing a flower and placing it in a shared vase. Our Flower Communion Ceremony celebrates beauty, diversity, and community. Please bring a flower to share, then take a flower home to remember the beauty of the season the annual meeting of Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church will be held on Sunday, June 13th from 1 to 3 p.m. on Zoom webinar. Please come to the annual meeting to hear reports from the board and the senior minister, elect new trustees and officers, adopt a budget for the coming year, and vote on the adoption of the eighth principle. All are welcome to attend but it is critical that we get a quorum of voting members so please make every effort to register and attend this important meeting. Registration is required and you may register for the And in preparation for the annual meeting, there will be informational meetings about the fiscal year 21-22 budget and the renovations process. The budget informational meetings will be held on Thursday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. and Saturday, June 5th at 11 a.m. The Renovation Task Force meetings will be held on Sunday, June 6th at 3 p.m. and then Tuesday, June 8th at 7 p.m. All these meetings will be on Zoom and the links will be provided in the e-news. As we enter this time of reflection and remembrance, celebration and community, we acknowledge that we gather as Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church on the traditional land of the Piscataway, Nakochtank, and Acostia people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have protected it through the generations. We remember those who were enslaved and worked this land without choice or reward. And we remember all who have gone before us whose vision and labor help create and sustain this, our religious community. In this spirit, we gather. In this spirit, we worship. Let us now greet and welcome each other in the chat.
in the struggles we choose for ourselves, in the way we move forward in our lives and bring our world forward with us, it is right to remember the names of those who gave us strength in this choice of living. It is right to name the power of hard lives well lived. We share history with those lives. We belong to the same motion. They too were strengthened by what had gone before, and they too were drawn on by a vision of what may come to be. Those who lived before us, who struggled for justice and suffered injustice before us, have not melted into dust. They have not disappeared. They are with us still. The lives they lived hold us steady. Their words remind us and call us back to ourselves. Their courage and love evoke our own. We, the living, carry them with us. We are their voices, their hands and their hearts. We take them with us and with them choose to deepen the path of living. Good morning. I am the Reverend Katie Romano Griffin, also known as Chaplain Griffin in the Civil Air Patrol. My pronouns are she or Asia, and today I'm lighting my chalice in Silver Spring, Wheaton. And as I share today's chalice lighting words, I invite you to read them with me and let me know in the chat where you're lighting your chalice from. As we kindle this flame, we honor and remember those who have passed into the mystery. Their brightness lives on in our vision. Their courage lives on in our commitments and their love continues to bless the world through us.
This Memorial Day weekend, we remember all who died in our wars. Wars not of their making, but whose lives were consumed by them. Our roll call reminds us that these are not nameless people who serve. We remember 625,000 who died in the Civil War. The 116,000 516 who died in World War I. The 406,000 who died in World War II. The 54,246 who died in the Korean War. The 58,220 who died in the Vietnam War. 1,562 who died in the first Iraq war, the 2,452 in Afghanistan, and 4,902 who died in Iraq and the Middle East. We remember the thousands of service members who died by suicide after leaving the armed forces. We remember the eight US service members who died since May 2020. First, Lieutenant Traverius Ravon Bowman, age 25. Specialist Nick Bravo Regules, 20. Senior Airman Jason Kai Fan, 26. Sergeant Brian Cooper Mount, 25. Sergeant Ronald J. Ule, 23. Specialist Vincent Sebastian Ibarria, 21. First Lieutenant Joseph Trent Alba, 24. Captain Kelly Ann Laley, 30. We speak their names that we have not forgotten and in honor of their service. We invite you now to share the names of your beloved ones in the chat. Fallen comrades, grandparents, parents, children, siblings, spouses and partners, mentors and friends. To all those here remembering, may life bless us in our going out and our coming in, in our grief and in our joy, in our remembering and in our forgetting. And may we live while we are alive, for life is brief in its days and even though thus shadowed with loss, life can also be beautiful.
Together, we recognize the cycle of life and death, the web of love, compassion, caring, and witness that is at the heart of this religious community. We hold in our circle of caring and love those who live with loss, grief, or chronic pain, with illnesses seen and unseen, with mental illness or addictions, those who care for loved ones in ill health, and whose primary spiritual practice is parenting. Within this Cedar Lane community, we hold our celebrations and our sorrows. This week's celebration is that Diana Thompson is retiring. And we hold these two new sorrows in our community as we recognize the passing of Dana Gunnison and Harry Flugel. Caring extends beyond our community to those whose lives are lost or impacted by violence, calamities, and the pandemic in our nation and in our world. This week, we hold in our hearts the Black community in Tulsa. We recognize the first, we recognize the 100 year anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa massacre when mobs of white residents burned what was then known as Black Wall Street to the ground, killing hundreds, injuring more and terrorizing the entire community. We hold in our hearts our nation and the community in Minneapolis as we remember this first anniversary of George Floyd's death. And we continue to wait and demand justice. We hold in our hearts the 602,000 who died in the US from COVID and all of their loved ones who are grieving. We hold in our hearts the loved ones of those who were shot in San Jose. 10 people were killed, many others were injured, and this is yet another blow for the Sikh community in particular as they grieve another loss, this one so close to the shooting a few weeks ago in Indianapolis. We open our hearts to hold these sorrows. Let us move into a space of prayer together. Holy One, Spirit of life, Spirit of love, Spirit of justice, be with us now. Stir in us through the grief a deeper love and a call and a courage to say yes. Yes to the change. Yes to building a better world for ourselves and for the many generations that will come behind us that we owe this just good world to. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. As we enter this time of silence together, I invite those among us mourning a loss or marking the anniversary of a loss to rise in body or spirit or share your loved one's name in the chat in mourning and memory.
Each Sunday during worship, we take up an offering and it serves as a reminder for ourselves that the offering is symbolic as well as practical. We know that it is through financial giving that we build our budget and fund our missions and our ministries of worship, religious education, pastoral care, social justice. We pay our staff and professional religious leaders and finance the comfort and beauty of our beautiful grounds. We pass the plate during our worship service to make a community expression of gratitude for the blessing of abundance, to vividly bring in the harvest at this most cherished hour of our week. Our offering says that the act of giving is as essential to our spiritual well being as anything else that we do on Sunday mornings. We are grateful for the incredible generosity of our members friends and fans throughout this time in support of our mission and ministry and the many community organizations that we partner with in service of our bold mission. There are many ways to give at Cedar Lane. You can give by the electronic means of our modern times, by text, online giving, PayPal, QR code, or you can mail a check to the church. Our Share the Plate this morning is going to help support Action in Montgomery, or AIM, and they've provided us with a short video so that you can learn a little bit more about them. When I discovered what AIM was about, it responded to the passion that I had in my heart. Cambia la autoestima al, tra al trabajar con personas que, que lo apoyan, lo guían y le, le hacen ver a uno a qué tiene derecho y a qué no tiene derecho. Ya, yeah. es sirve, la verdad. Sí. The world is in so many ways too broken and the stakes are too high to do ineffective organizing that mostly just makes us feel like we're doing something. A lot of the time the folks that have the political power are treated with kid gloves. But we're all citizens, we're all equals. Even if we don't have a good result, we always try to, to look how we're going to have a new strategy, how to have a good result. And we walked out of the meeting totally depressed. And Jonathan Lang, who was then the advisor to Mark Fraley from Industrial Areas Foundation, said to us, what did you learn? What was he saying to you? And finally, someone piped in and said, we don't represent, when you look at the room, this county. And until we represent the county, we can't do the ask. And so we spent the next year becoming 22 congregations, and we were able to work with the county expediting, along with the state, all-day kindergarten over a number of years was the first really great success in 2001-2002, along with increasing the Housing Initiative Fund. And I remember that night asking the county executive at that time for $10 million for affordable housing. And that was a lot of money during that time. The first and most important blessing of organizing is knowing that the people have the power and that the people have the power to make a difference in literally every circumstance if we're organized enough. When AIM was created, it was the second IAF organization in Maryland. We now are on the cusp of having five organizations, which positions us to not only deal with Montgomery County politics, but statewide because some things we can deal with at the county level, but there's a lot of issues that really need to be addressed at the state level. And we've got the power, we've got the opportunity, and I think that's the next stage of our growth. Montgomery Action, yo la verdad estoy bien agradecida que haya llegado a nuestra comunidad porque hemos hecho cambios que están a la vista. The people that their voice are not heard, I always want to work with them to change for a better future.
Hello, dear ones. When I think of building a multicultural, multiracial, beloved community as envisioned by the eighth principle, I like to think of all the ways that each one of us are unique and special and different. And what makes us special, we bring that to our community. And that is what is beloved community. When we can bring all the parts of who we are and what makes us different from other people into the room, then we can have beloved community. And that reminds me of this story. It's okay to be different. We are all different. Do you know each and every person is different? It's true. If everyone looked and acted the same, how would we know who is who? Some kids love to swim and some like to hike. Some like to dance and some love to bike. We are all different. Some kids love the color blue and some adore yellow. Maybe pink is your favorite color, like this little fellow. Some kids love to build towers out of blocks. Some kids enjoy wearing different colored socks. We are all different. Some kids have blonde hair and light colored skin. Some kids have dark hair and dark colored skin. Some kids are big and some kids are small. Some kids are short and others are tall. We are all different. Some kids are great at science and math. Other kids choose a whole nother path. Perhaps playing sports or music's their thing. Some kids play an instrument while others can sing. We are all different. Some kids wear glasses that help them to see. Some kids talk with an accent that's different from me. Some kids get to ride in cool looking chairs. They take the ramp while others take stairs. We are all different. Some kids have glasses, crutches, wheelchairs, and slings, but it's never okay to make fun of these things. Even though we don't all look, act, or sound alike, one thing is true. Every child is an individual, a person like you. You should always be kind to those who are different from you, because to them, you are different too. Remember, it's okay to be different. It's okay to be you. You were made to be different. You were made to be you. It is okay to be different. Who do you know who is different from you? If you have noticed differences, maybe they have too. What about them makes them different from you? And if you want to show them kindness, what would you do? The end.
Our guest speaker this morning is Paula Cole Jones. Paula is a lifelong Unitarian Universalist and an active member and lay leader at All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, DC. She's the founder of Adore, a dialogue on race and ethnicity and past president of DRUM, Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. Paula is a management consultant with over two decades of experience in designing and facilitating workshops and dialogues for leaders and organizations on intercultural competencies and institutional change. She served for many years as director of racial and social justice, and also as a congregational lead consultant in our central East region. Paula is the editor of a Skinner House book, Encounters, Poems about Race, Ethnicity, and Identity, and a contributing author for three Skinner House books, including the UUA Common Read, Justice on Earth. With Bruce Pollock Johnson, Paula co-authored The Eighth Principle and is now a leader in advancing The Eighth Principle as a way of embodying the beloved community in our movement. Currently, 62 congregations, along with the Unitarian Universalist Ministry for the Earth and a couple of state action networks, have adopted the eighth principle, and many other congregations have a set a date in upcoming weeks, including Cedar Lane on June 13th. So as we welcome Paula, to join me in a conversation now about the eighth principle and building the beloved community. Let me begin by quoting what the eighth principle says. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Reverend Abi. It's great to be here. It is wonderful to have you join us in worship this morning. And I wanna begin by asking you, why do we need an eighth principle at this point in our association's history and life? Um, you know, we've actually needed an eighth principle for a long time. Um, I have been thinking about this. We needed it 50 years ago when the association experienced the black empowerment controversy as it's called. Uh, the eighth principle has been a long time coming. Uh, it was first written in 2013. So we've been working since then to um, to have a grassroots movement of congregations that adopt the eighth principle. It takes a long time for institutional change to happen. So I, I wanna maybe rephrase your question as 
why is it happening now? We mm -hmm. have needed it for a long time. But why is it happening now? But let me give it back to you. Do you have a reflection on why we need the eighth principle? Well, thank you for throwing it back at me, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I think about us as a faith movement, and I think about the premise and the promise of Unitarian Universalism that brought many people of color and BIPOC people such as myself into this movement, it is our liberating theology, liberating, inclusive, pluralistic theology that invites all into being in community together. It is that premise and promise that brought me into this faith and it is what has kept me in this faith. And when I witness to who we are, as we are, and where we are, I recognize the gap between the promise and the practice of our faith. And while there have been times when I have found myself wishing for a more inclusive, diverse religious community, and at times frustrated and disappointed by the gap between the promise and the practice, and recognizing that sometimes aspirations alone don't fill your soul, I have wanted a way in which we seek to embody our theology in more real ways and actually move ourselves toward embodying the beloved community that our principles and purposes speak to. And I see the eighth principle providing us both a container and a way in which we may actually be able to journey toward that. And that is what I feel this moment is calling us to be and to do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, President Reverend Susan Frederick Gray said that if our covenant cannot change, it cannot lead us into the future. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful statement. The eighth principle is a proposed change in our principles, which also serve for many of us and, and maybe all of us on some level as a part of our covenant. So we are, we are asking ourselves as a religious movement to really to update our covenant so that it can lead us into the future that we aspire to. Um, we can also ask ourselves, so if we've needed an eighth principle for so long and we've been working at it specifically since 2013, why now is it moving? Mm. And it's moving rapidly. Why at this moment does the eighth principle then have uh, not just the momentum, but but there's a there's an embrace of the eighth principle. It's almost like it it was there and we were not ready as a movement. And now we are. So I, I think sometimes of like the taproot of a plant or a tree that holds it firmly in place. So there's, there's something that we could not see and maybe still to some degree cannot see that was holding us very firmly in place and not allowing us to move as we needed to move. Um, so what is shaking that loose right now? 
And I think it's because we maybe for the first time in a very long time are experiencing and have experienced an existential threat Mm. as a collective. The eighth principle is asking of us to create safety, inclusion, and belonging for groups that have been historically marginalized in this country. The historically marginalized groups live with that existential threat, but not everyone experiences that. Certainly in the past year, we all have experienced it. And I actually think that that is making a big difference in our ability to move now. Now I would describe that existential threat in terms of three things. One, the pandemic for sure. Mm -hmm. None of us were safe or we're still still not completely out of it. Uh, And so we experienced a, a kind of connectedness with all people around the world Um, in terms of our own survival. The second, a year ago, we watched George Floyd be murdered right in public. It wasn't the first time, of course, it's not the last, but we all watched it. And I don't think that George Floyd's murder was the existential threat itself. But the fact that protests, Mm. the Black Lives Matter protests that happened across the country, around the world, but day after day, people risked their lives in the face of a pandemic that was killing people. People risked their lives to say, no more, stop this. We have to stop police killings and certainly of black and brown people. So that was the second one. And then the third one is the risk of uh, democracy itself. For the last four to five years, it has been unquestionable for me that fascism is a risk to this country and perhaps to the world. And it culminated with the insurrection on January the 6th. So all of us in this country, at least, have experienced this collective threat. And I think that that is shaking that taproot loose Mm. so that people are, are recognizing we can no longer afford to rest in our own comfort, but that we really must collect and create that safety and belonging across the board. Yeah, that's you, you raise a really good uh, uh, point there, uh, Paula, in, in connecting what we are seeking to do as a movement in the context of the larger picture and what is happening in our nation today. And the point that I hear you make especially is why this is a moral moment and why this moral moment provides us with the imperative to move us forward into a different mode and way of being together being in community together. That is, that is shifting away from established entrenched patterns of being that we have gotten quite accustomed to religiously, culturally, socially, and are rather comfortable in being in that way. And this moment is calling us now to stretch to shift 
the paradigm to actually be who we have always said we want to be, yearn to be, a more inclusive, pluralistic, communication focused in creating a deeper, wider, and more engaged religious community. Now, that's a big ask. Yeah. And while we have been liberal in our theology, I submit that as Unitarian Universalists, we have been orthodox in practice and conservative in policy. And this kind of a paradigm shift calls us to actually become progressive, which means we have more work to do to bring our theology, our practice, and our policies into closer alignment. So how do you see us moving ourselves forward in that way? Um, well, I want to start by saying the eighth principle is already having an impact. It's already doing its job and it's still I want to say relatively young in terms of the the wider embrace of it. So, um, you know, it's even hard to imagine what might happen and who we might become as it becomes more normalized for us. In addition to the eighth principle, though, I, I've also proposed that we see our identity as a community of communities. And I think that these two things together will have a profound impact on our ability to move into the future in a different way. And um, the eighth principle gives us a collective interpretation of the seven principles and how to live them. Um, Without this, I think it's too easy for us to have an individual interpretation. Our individualism can prevent us from seeing uh, kind of the, you know, what we've been talking about in terms of, of our ability, our future to create safety and cohesion, to grow as a movement. Individualism can be in the way of that, because as long as I am okay, my domain is okay, that can relieve me of the responsibility for correcting some of these other um, inequalities, some of the historic uh, norms. It, it can, it can help me to separate myself from what's happening. As we said, during the course of the pandemic, we had to look at the whole of who we are. The eighth principle calls us to look at the whole of who we are every day, moving forward. That'll be quite a change. And it is spiritual work. So Reverend Avi, I have a question for you. <laughs> Uh, it is said that the purpose of religion is to change us. And, you know, as we talk about this being a moral moment and, you know, the eighth principle is working, we see change in action. In fact, some of your members experienced that on the 16th when we had our workshop and the eighth principle opens up a whole conversation that was there, but it was kind of dormant, right? And now that energy is being unleashed. If the, how, do you, how would you, as a minister, with all of your experience, speak to that idea that the purpose of religion is for us to change and grow? Uh, 
thank you, Paula. I appreciate your, your asking me that question about the purpose of religion. And especially in the context of Unitarian Universalism, the purpose is to be constantly changing. You know, I'm reminded of uh, a universalist minister who responded in one context about what is your religion in saying, we do not stand for in a static way, we move. And to me, that is at the heart of who we say we are as a faith. And which is again, why we give our heart and our lives, not to empty creeds, but the deeds of how we live our values and our convictions. You know, I'm reminded of a, a wonderful story that uh, a Unitarian Universalist theologian and uh, social thinker, James Luther Adams once shared when he was uh, a member of First Unitarian Church in Chicago in the 1940s. And this actually happened in 1948. Uh, Adams was a member of the board of trustees when the, when the congregation was uh, discussing desegregation because at that time their bylaws clearly stated that the church was intended for whites only. And the board of trustees engaged in a very deep spirited discussion that went on for hours in which while most of the trustees were supportive of desegregation, there were some members who were not. And one of them was particularly vociferous in his opposition essentially saying that by asking people and the church to desegregate, we are actually making it sound like a creedal requirement that somehow we are going to be more inclusive and welcome black people into the congregation. And therefore he was opposed to it saying that we need to give people the freedom to choose whether they want to integrate or remain separate. And so this went on and on and on until early hours of the morning. By that time, Adams and others were quite tired that Adams turned to this guy and then said, so what do you think the purpose of our religion and the church is? And this person responded back saying, I think the purpose of our church is to change people like me. And then the trustees voted to desegregate First Unitarian Church. Well, what a perfect story. <laughs> because we're at another one of those moments. And um, I'm hoping that your church will vote <laughs> to accept the eighth principle. But not just your church, many churches. I'm less concerned about your church voting and in favor of it than I am that it continues to spread. You know, I wanna share um, maybe a final thought. I am excited about this because if we do this work now, right now, the children in religious education will grow up with this as part of their religious identity. It'll be second nature, just like technology is second nature for our children. Um, so uh, I, I am hopeful about the future if we can move through this moment in a positive way. Thank you, Paula. I really appreciate uh, your, your taking the time to speak to us this morning and share some thoughts. And uh, I, I wish we had more time to be able to continue this conversation. And uh, I, I recognize that uh, we, we will be able to have more engaged discussions as we go along because this work is not the culmination, rather the beginning. And, yes. and by, by committing ourselves to the eighth principle, 
we are committing ourselves to be more intentionally on the journey together now. And, and, and to me, that is, is an important aspect that we carry into this process as we prepare ourselves to be able to, to adopt and then to embody the eighth principle and the beloved community. So thank yes. you again. And I look forward to continuing this. Thank you. Great to be with you today. From the light of days remembered Burns a beacon bright and clear Guiding hands and hearts and spirits Into faith set free from fear When the fire of commitment Sets our mind and soul ablaze When our hunger and our power to call us on our way when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin from the stories of our living rings a song both brave and free calling still to witness to the life of liberty when the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze when our hunger and our passion meet to call us on our way when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within then our promise finds fulfillment and our can begin from the dreams of youthful vision comes a new prophetic voice which demands a deeper justice built by our courageous choice when the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze when our hunger our passion mean to call us on our way when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin Our words of benediction come to us from my colleague and dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Hope Johnson. We are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive. We care deeply. We live our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing, and rejoicing, getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, living our answers, learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves, apologizing and forgiving with humility, being forgiven through grace, creating the beloved community together. We are one. So go in peace, go making peace, living gently, loving mightily, and building the beloved community. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be. Oh, beautiful for 
spacious skies for amber waves of green for purple mountains majesties above thy fruited plain America America God shed much grace on thee so spread the love sent from above from sea to shining sea oh beautiful thy immigrants who hail from every land their hope and heart and diligence like gifts from God's own hand America America thy grace, thy grace. shall With open arms again Oh beautiful, oh mother earth On this world at your breast Just as we sing with love and pride Shining sea